Also, if I could please introduce too, this is Mary Dagg, who was in the movie as well, and sister, and daughter. Well, we've much to discuss. Uh, <laughs> we, we have uh, uh, an audience of people who adore you, uh, an audience of people from around the world who have been inspired by you, um, myself included, of course. I feel very choked up. Um, every time I've seen this movie, this is like I see the sixth or seventh time I've seen it, I get very choked up. Because for me, the, the movie is really a story about victory, about overcoming challenges, and really making that difference in the world that you would hope to make. So thank you for being that, that inspiration for so many of us. Thank you. So um, we, have, we have a couple questions, and then we want to open up to the audience for your participation and thoughts as well. We have some people with microphones in the audience who will be going around and uh, providing those to you so you can make your voice be heard. Um, and I think, uh, Anne, I'd like to know what it is from, from your long career. You've done so many things with studying giraffes and advocating for and speaking up, uh, speaking truth to power about the, um, the important contributions that women should be empowered to make, uh, the great diversity of contributions to so many different fields of science. What would you say is the, the single greatest, I don't know, accomplishment in your life? I'd like to think it was having me, but I don't think so. <laughs> I, I think maybe what, um, just doing this film was uh, the best thing I ever did, because I had done stupid things, but this, <laughs> this one didn't really talk, talk about them. <laughs> I think stupid things is a bit of an us underestimation of what you had done before. <laughs> The, the, the desire to go to South Africa in, in such a, a challenging set of conditions, you know, by yourself, as, as was said in the video many times, she was Jane Goodall before Jane Goodall was Jane Goodall, right, by almost a decade, um, and without the institutional support that Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey and uh, the, uh, the, the folks who were supported by, by Louis Leakey. So it, it's a, it takes a, a tremendous amount of intestinal fortitude and strength to be able to, to do that. It must have been more than just seeing the giraffes at the Brookfield Zoo <laughs> that, that had stimulated that. Could you speak to that? Well, uh, well yeah, I guess it is really because um, I, was, I am a, well, I don't know how, what I, well, <laughs> <laughs> I was determined and, uh, and I, wa I wanted the world to be as good a place as it possibly can be and it just drives me nuts when we have people doing unfair things like me not getting. <laughs> yeah, the tenure. Yeah, that was a very bad one. Um, any ex extra? Yeah, I think it was just an unbelievable drive. Um, and I think a lot of part of what drives mom is it's not for accolations. It's not to say I was the first or I was the best or whatever. It's just that, oh my God, I've got to figure this out and then I've got to tell everybody about it. That was sort of the, the drive. You know, which is just totally altruistic, if you will. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're trying to be like me, aren't you? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> An inspiration oh. close to home as well. Of course. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Very true. Awesome. Um, you know, speaking of being an inspiration, so the we have so many people in the audience who are who are zookeepers, and thanks for and maybe a hand again for all the awesome zookeepers that we have that are here and are in the valley. <laughs> But also uh, a hand, a shout out for all of the conservation partners who are here, my, my department, other folks who work out in the field doing things in Africa on behalf of things too. So for those folks, what would you say is, is the best piece of advice that you could provide to a budding conservationist, a budding animal lover, a budding uh, zoologist to be? Oh, well, I think what, what we want to be is animals never getting fewer than there are today. Um, my daughter actually is fussing about that. <laughs> <laughs> but what would be, what would you say is the biggest, um, if someone wants to be like you, what would you, what advice would you give them? Oh, um, well, just do it. Do 
you, you just say, I, I know that's right, and it's, and it would be wrong not to do it, so just do it because it's right. And, and uh, I guess it does hurt sometimes, but it hurts worse if you, <laughs> if you, <laughs> if you don't. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> just do it. Absolutely. <laughs> Very true. Absolutely. You know, y your work in support of giraffe and giraffe conservation continues, of course, through the Ann Innes Dag Foundation. Um, I'd encourage everyone to go to anninnesdagfoundation.org. Uh, the URL is on the back of your bookmark that's in the back of the room, which we encourage everyone to pick up. And uh, could you speak to <laughs> our mascot that we have here a little bit too, Anne, along those lines, please? So you, you well, this is just a... What is it? Uh, well, um, when when mom, Anne, was uh, 11 years old, she had a scarlet fever. So this is in Toronto in Canada. And at the time, they really had no idea where it came from, what it was about. And um, they ended up having to put a sign on the front lawn of where she lived, quarantine area. And my mom and then the, there was three other, like uh, her sister and two brothers, uh, we're all in the house together, so they had to take mom at the age of 11 and put her in isolation ward by herself um, because they were so worried that, you know, it was going to spread and everybody else was going to get sick. They burned all of her clothes. They burned all of her books. Um, they just didn't want it to spread. So when mom was in the isolation ward for the month, she was by herself. And, of course, you can just imagine her <laughs> mother going, oh, my God. So she actually made my, my grandmother, Mary Quayle, who I was named after, she named, uh, or she made her a mom and a dad and a baby giraffe. So the mom and the dad, um, you know, the little blue and the little pink, and then there was a little baby one too. So mom still has those. They're still, they're 80 years old, but they're hanging on. Um, and this was actually made in tribute to that. So every single one, and this was made by a volunteer, uh, who's obviously very amazing at the, doing this kind of stuff, and every single one is unique, just like the giraffe. Their spot pattern is unique because when they cut out all the material, it's all different. So uh, yeah, so that was sort of the background for our, our little guys. So we're selling those for 40 US, shameless plug, uh, but <laughs> for those that are interested. But that money goes to the Ann and the Stag Foundation. Yes, so mom has kindly agreed, although sometimes she forgets this, uh, she's covering all the administration that goes along with the Ann and the Stag Foundation. So anything that you buy or any donation that you make goes 100% to all the uh, activities that we've, we sponsor. That's great. And we have many of these in the back for sale and several books as well. So <laughs> please contribute. <laughs> So to the foundation, um, there were several organizations on there that on the screen at the end of the, of the documentary that you had mentioned. Um, Wild Nature Institute is one that we work with a lot at the Lindgren Desert uh, with Monica Bond and Derek Lee there uh, in Tanzania in support of giraffe conservation. Um, but what was it about a Wild Nature Institute and Save the Giraffes that, that really drew you to them to support them? Were they continuing your work with communities, with surveys? What, what was it that, that really drew your attention to those organizations? Um, it was just a little, yeah, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, um, I guess with both of those organizations, the key really with um, Mom or Anne's view is working with the indigenous people to the people that are there on the ground. Um, the worst thing we want to be is sort of this white privilege that shows up and says, hey, Africans, let me tell you how to run your country. Um, never goes over well. So uh, the idea with those two organizations is they actually have boots on the ground. So they've got indigenous people working with the kids in terms of you know education equals conservation. That's one of our mottos with our foundation. And they also do a lot of stuff with the children. And that's another part of, of uh, what the foundation's all about. So I know both of those organizations are really, really all behind that, that theory. Let's try and work with the locals. Let's get them excited about this stuff. And let's see what their idea ideas are and how can we help with those ideas? How can we contribute? That's great. Yeah, it's it, really local people are the way that conservation will happen. Local, that's how peak conservation will be sustainable in the long term. There was a great quote that was said that people are the, the owners of the land. They are the, they are the ones who live there. They're the ones that will determine the future of conservation. So working with local people, it's a core part of what we do, of course, at the Living Desert. But what your foundations do is, is right in line. And that's why we also work so closely with them as well, with Wild Nature Institute.
So um, please support the Ann Innes Dag Foundation, dot org. Uh, and uh, I think if we could have the house lights come up, and if there are questions, we'd like to open the questions out to the audience. If folks could raise your hand. If you're in the front row, I can hear you, so I can repeat the question. Uh, if you're in the back, uh, a microphone will be brought to you. I'm very interested in this as a documentary. I thought it was excellent. I'm curious about the film of the early days. Were those staged with those actual films that were taken back then? Uh, it's actually a combination. So the mirroring shots, which is the stuff that was taken in the 1950s, which the color had just come out. And the footage was mostly taken by Um Alex. He would take with his camera or sometimes mom would take him. And uh, they would do all that stuff back in the day. And then Alison Reed, who's the filmmaker who did an amazing job, we went back there and she said, we reached out to somebody called a fixer, which is somebody who's sort of local and knew the area around Chutzpreit. It's always hard to say that word. Um, and her name was Debbie and she said, you know, oh, I recognize all those shots. Let's recreate them. So before we even went down, she said, okay, we need to go along this road and look here and then you'll see exactly the mountain, exactly the angle, this was here, here's the road now, and recreate those scenes. So um, I think the longest is maybe eight or 10 seconds, but those took hours and hours and hours to do. Um, especially with Allison, who's, she's like a perfectionist and poor mom was standing there and she's like, oh, the clouds aren't right, the heat's not right, all oh, the angle's wrong. And I'm like, just take the photo, like give me a break. It just went on and on and on. But they were perfect. They came out really, really well. So it was worth the pain. <laughs> so that was the majority of, one, of them. There are a couple of ones that we recreated. Uh, there was a scene where there's a young woman sort of walking through the bush um, and that one was actually recreated. We had to look around for a woman who was left-handed and looked like my mother, because she's a Southpaw. So that took a bit, <laughs> a bit of trying to find an actress who looked and she was left-handed and all this stuff. And then in the car for the recreation, they had to reverse it as well because she couldn't find, Allison couldn't find the left-hand drive or the right-hand drive, I always confuse it. Left-hand drive, thank you. Right-hand drive, she couldn't find the right-hand drive. Um, so she had to take a left-hand drive and kind of reverse the, the scene so it looked more realistic and then have them writing with the left hand. <laughs> it's all very complicated. Yeah, complicated. But that was a recreated scene. But the majority were those mirroring scenes was actually, you know, mom in her 20s and now mom in her 80s, almost 90. Uh, <laughs> but um, those are, people love those scenes. I think those are some of the, the favorite scenes that people like with the mirroring. Good evening. I'm Jeff with a G, and in second grade, I was the Jeff, Jeff the Dancing Giraffe. I actually wrote a report based on information that you wrote. My mom's searching for it. But I did paint a painting for you of a giraffe in appreciation. But what I wanted to ask you, what, what's the main lesson you learned from giraffe? The main lesson I, I learned from giraffe. Well, I don't know whether I should have done this, but I really felt that the giraffe had, was really as important as I was. And it occur, occurred to me any animal could be shot by a whole lot of people and that would be the end of it. And, and I guess I felt that and I couldn't get it out of my head and Mary helped me. <laughs> Yeah. And, and sort of a deep identification with them as well. Yeah. And, it, and it, well, I mean, it's just so important that we don't kill any animal to the, if any particular species that might be helpful or useful or love, loving or <laughs> anything that's great. <laughs> Absolutely. Folks up front have one, you can just raise your hand and we can. Uh, there are a lot of safaris that take place in Africa these days, and some of them are very expensive and um, glitchy. And what would be your opinion? Uh, do you think these safaris are 
beneficial in terms of educating people about what is happening to the animals or are they detrimental? Sorry, I'm, I don't hear very well, which is why I'm pausing. <laughs> what was it again? Um, whether the safaris are, when people go out to Africa and they'll take a safari, they're going with their own guides and things, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think if you're a, a bad person, then you shouldn't do it. <laughs> but if you're a good person, I, th I think it's a wonderful thing to do. And, and it's a whole new th way to even think about things. I know uh, when I was there, there were... Um, I'd have a couple of little black kids come and w work with me just because they have nothing else to do, and they weren't in, hall, in school. And so I'd be, I'd just say, you know, we want to pick up the, the, the this, uh, this and that. Uh, 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 leaves and stuff like yeah, that? Sleeves, yeah, sleeves, yeah. yeah. And uh, th th this made a, this made a huge difference because then then we were friends and their parents become friends and then everyone sees well you know I've never spoken to that bed and then he's black how can that be mm -hmm. and and it, it, it's so super when you get it so that you know you're they're as good as you are and then we're having this super talk and we have I ideas that are different and this happened all, all the time really. Yeah, and I guess when you go on the safaris, it gives you an opportunity, hopefully, to meet a lot of the indigenous people. Because a lot of them, when we were certainly there, a lot of them are the rangers, they're the, the drivers, they're the spotters, if you're going out at night, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I, I think it's a good thing. It's a, certainly a good source of income for a lot of these areas, because uh, a lot of them work in those roles mentioned, but a lot of them will work in the resorts, whether it be food or bedding or whatever. So I think it's a good injection of, of money into their economy. We've got one all the way in the back here. Thank you. I'm Kendra. I'm visiting from Seattle. I was one of those kids that was obsessed with giraffes in the zoo. I actually grew up near Brookfield Zoo. But then I just went through a period of decades until now where I didn't believe in zoos. And a lot of kids, I've, I've worked with kids over my lifetime, they're the same. Like, I'm just going to boycott zoos. That's my contribution to animal welfare. You know, your average seven-year-old I talk to. So I wonder what your opinion is about zoos. And then one more sort of question is, it was very curious how that one man's theory about people aren't so into giraffes because we identify more with chimpanzees. I'd never heard that before. I mean, here I am wearing my elephant sweater. So <laughs> elephants are very popular and I never think, oh, I love them because they are or aren't like humans. I just love them and giraffes too. So I, I wonder if you agree with what that expert, I don't know which one who said that. I think that was Fred Berkowitz, yeah. So the first question, how do you feel about zoos? Pardon? What are your thoughts about zoos? Oh, our thoughts is about zoos. I think um, I wouldn't set a, a, get another one at all. But since there are a lot of animals in zoos, I think they should be kept in zoos and made as happy as possible. And uh, I, do, I don't really think we need to have too many zoos. Um, I, I, it's, hard, it's hard to say, but I think we can get along without any. But <laughs> <laughs> Forget about our sponsor That's a pretty here. Strong <laughs> statement. All right. Brought to you by the Living Desert Zoo and Gardens. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. So good to have some opinions. I mean, I think they do. They do serve a purpose in the sense that um, Mom wouldn't have even known about giraffes had she not gone to a zoo. So you know, if, as soon as she saw it, she's like, "Ah, oh, I'm going to spend the rest of my life devoted to this animal." And you love to think that there's lots of other kids that are doing. The same thing for whatever animal that they uh, feel engaged with. Um, and I do, th I do think that zoos are doing a lot better job now, and certainly in terms of the enrichment piece. At one point, it was like, you feed them, make sure they've got some space, maybe you've got the vet bills, and that's it. But I find that there's a lot more focus now on the mental side of it. You know, is there stuff that they can do? Are they engaged in their day? Like, sometimes they'll you know, not necessarily for giraffe, but um, some animals, they'll hide the food. So at least there's a little bit of, you know, got to search for food. 
Um, I agree that I don't, I don't think they should be taking anything out of the wild at this point, but anything that is in a zoo, maybe just transfer between zoos, and when they have the babies, they can maybe move them around the zoos as well. Um, just with if respect to the second question. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I could say a word or two. Um, as a sort of representative of zoos, um, you know, there, there, there's an organization called the Association for Zoos and Aquariums, AZA, uh, which is the highest level of animal care, guarantees that the zoos that are members of AZA are doing their very best using the very state-of-the-art, leading-edge kind of animal care, animal enrichment, um, uh, habitat design, integrated species, habitats. If you come to our zoo, if I could toot our own horn, um, you'll see all of those things, right? Uh, not, most zoos are not members of AZA. About 90% of zoos that exist in North America are not AZA accredited, right? So 10% of zoos. There are over 2,000 zoological type organizations in North America, Canada, the US, and Mexico. About 240 of them are AZA, right? And we are, of course, one of those, so we're, that's why we're bringing this up. Uh, and so I think that uh, it's not smart either way to say zoos are terrible, zoos are perfect, right? Not all people are terrible and not all people are great. You need to know the organization and some organizations, like I think we are, are at the forefront of animal care and animal well-being and also in the field, in situ conservation, caring for giraffes in Tanzania and in South Africa where we have projects where we go quite frequently to do these things and we work in support of those organizations. Conservation is much more of a part of who we are as a zoo at the Living Desert, as well as other zoos that are part of AZA. So it's up to you to decide, of course, uh, but you know, zoo's great, zoo's bad, I don't think that's the question. Um, question. Yes, so the, the second question was uh, with respect to chimpanzees and Jane Goodall versus mom and giraffes, which I think was kind of the, the gist of the question. Um, I have, I mean, my theory is that, she, number one, she's got a great name, Goodall. Like, it just, <laughs> um, I think what is all, I, I do believe, though, that the chimpanzees, because they are so closely related to human beings, I think there's a huge, uh, most people kind of make a connection with that more. And uh, certainly Jane, when she did a lot of her studies, she was physically holding them. So she would hold them, she would name them, names like Diane and, and different kinds of things. And, and there was times when she was trying to study them and they wouldn't, they'd be up in the trees uh, hanging out and then she thought, well, I'll just bring in some bananas. So she'd bring in bananas and down they would come and eat the bananas. So she was able to kind of bring them closer to us. So there was more of a connection there, if you will. Um, whereas I think with giraffe, I remember mom saying she'd studied giraffes for 60 plus years and she'd never touched a giraffe until the one time when we went back to Brookfield Jew. And I thought, what? Like, I just couldn't get my head around that. How can you be so passionate about something and never actually get close enough to touch it? It just seems so weird to me. But I think that's part of it too, the, the physical contact versus just observing in the distance. I don't know. Uh, there was a question down front here. James will give you twenty dollars after That's the right. show. <laughs> <laughs> it was very nice words said about the, the living we, desert. We've got one we'll here. Go to, to a question back there. Hi, my name is Lily Mata, and I'm a guest service associate at uh, our local zoo, the Living Desert. Giraffes are my all-time favorite, so this is so cool. Um, but steering away from the giraffes, um, I am part of the LGBTQ plus community as well. Um, I do, or I am on the autism spectrum, or autism, autistic spectrum. And um, on a regular basis, I do feel like the odds are against me, not only being feminine presenting, but all the other things I just mentioned. Um, how did you continue to find motivation in all those times of rejection and uh, 
frankly, intolerance, um, you know, not only by so many people, but in particular, you know, a, a male dominated world because uh, I struggle finding motivation every day to keep going and chase my dreams and uh, some advice would very much be helpful. Um, I'd love to hear about Okay, uh, we are, we're a little bit different than giraffe. <laughs> but you're, you're saying... Well, I guess in terms of a, a woman, or what, I guess in terms of a woman having to fight against, um, you know, the way, the way it was, whereas you were a man and you could get ahead, and as a woman you should know your place. Um, and, she's, and I guess the question from um, this individual was, like, how did you kind of, how did you keep going knowing that there was all this negative stuff that was out there, but you just said, you know what, I'm just going to keep doing my thing. Was there something that you... Yeah, I, yeah, I guess, I guess it, it, it just... Um, in, the, in the Bible, I think that some um, people kill themselves because of... Um, just, just because they... they well, I guess... Uh, Where are you going with this? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, I was just going to say that um, I think everyone should go to a uh, uh, zoo because I think you, you can see a whole lot of things that, and then think to yourself, you know, are they, why, why are they the way they are? And uh, I, I think that's all, all I can get. Yeah, place. I mean, I think I, one thing I would recommend to really anybody is um, seek out people that are like you because that really helps in terms of the supportive stuff. Um, if you're at a university and you're a woman and you're thinking, oh man, there's you know hardly any women in the class, this is ridiculous. Like try and get sort of a peer group that you can hang out with, somebody who's, you don't necessarily have to be friends with them, but they're a peer that you can bounce ideas off. Also look for mentors. So someone who's been there, done that, and you can maybe look up to them and figure out, okay, how did you get there? How did you deal with this? Um, the downside when mom was going through it, there wasn't anybody else. She was it. <laughs> there were no other women. So I was like, okay, who am I going to mentor with? But now, luckily, there's a lot more stuff out there. Long way to go, don't get me wrong. But I, I would highly recommend is, is looking out for that support network that you can just bounce stuff off. And there's the days when you're just like, oh, I can't do this anymore. At least they can turn around and say, you know what, find a reason, keep moving forward. I think we have time for just one more, probably, back here. I would just like to say thank you to Anne for a life of dedication and humility and education that she has brought to the world. She, for me, she is equal to Jane Goodall. My, my, my husband and I have been to Africa numerous times, and we have seen giraffes up close. And I must say, it is a unique experience to stand there and look into the eyes of a giraffe and have the giraffe look back, straight eye-to-eye -eye contact. You don't find that with a lot of wild animals. They usually run away. But a giraffe, giraffe will stand there and look at you for what you are. So you picked a good animal to study. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, and I just wanted to say as well, thank you so much for the Living Desert. They gave us an amazing tour this afternoon. And if you haven't been there, you should go. It's amazing. They have 10 giraffes all wandering around and lots of other creatures. And yeah, it was great. Uh, and the other thing is, Mom is a, a shameless. She loves coming and talking to people. I was just saying, Mom loves to come. If you want to come afterwards and get your picture taken or, or talk to Mom, she loves that stuff. So, or get stuff signed. It's all good. Yeah, yeah. This was somebody actually donated this to us. Yeah, they're like, you should wear these pants, and Mom's like, okay. <laughs> we right. did. We did look a little odd going into the McDonald's this morning. I will say so. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Mary.
Thank you very much, Ann. Thank you all. Thank you guys so much. It's awesome. Thank you.